Well, good, meet, good midweek to all of you. Thank you for joining with us for our Bible study. Whenever you happen to tune in to watch it, uh, it's broadcast first on Wednesday evenings at 6.30. That's the same time we have the in-person Bible study here at the church, but you can watch it anytime on demand. So thank you for joining with us. I waited to say this until we were taping. Uh, we always have a little conversation uh, before we uh, start taping, but I, I waited so that the people online would hear this. Uh, if you come to the church this week and you need to go to the office for something, uh, the entrance to the office is closed for some repair. And uh, most of you know that because those of you that parked on this side of the church, I was sitting at my desk watching as people came and every one of you, I'm glad none of you tripped over anything and broke a hip because you uh, were all looking uh, at, at the noise and the activity that was happening over there wondering what was going on. Well, what's going on is that portico over the door of the office over the years has rotted and the, the posts were literally just rotting away. So uh, the time has come that it's got to be replaced and that they started that process this morning. So if you need to get into the office, you'll need to either come in through the weekly building side or you can come in through the, uh, the main doors here at the uh, worship center entrance and come in through the back hallway into the office. Um, it'll, it'll be a little... Um, inconvenient for the next few days, but it's just one of those things that has to happen. It wouldn't be safe to walk in underneath with them doing the work there. Well, it's good to see you today. We're in the 92nd Psalm. <coughs> I invite you to take your Bible and turn to that passage. <coughs> and I remind you that if uh, this month, <coughs> which is almost over, it just, it's just, it blows my mind how quickly the summer passes. I was thinking yesterday, if you were a, a, a kid in school, um, from the days that I went to school when it didn't start back until after Labor Day. We got out about Memorial Day and we went back after Labor Day. Uh, right now, it would be almost like into August because it's that close to the beginning of school starting back. It won't be but just a few more weeks and the kids will be getting ready to go back to school. And um, But if you come, in, this is what I started to say, if you come in, in this month or next month on our nighttime Bible study on Wednesday, we're meeting in Wilson Hall and we're doing that because the children's ministry asked if they could use the chapel during uh, these two months that the kids are out for the school year. They do their scheduling a little bit different and they, they have a bigger gathering of the kids uh, during the summer uh, in the chapel room. So we move for that purpose. So I know some of you come in the morning and at night. And if you do, uh, we are in Wilson Hall, not the chapel uh, through the month of July. Well, today we're in the 92nd Psalm. And I'll tell you that this is a very uh, neglected Psalm. Several weeks ago, I tried to stay several weeks ahead in just studying and getting ready for these Bible studies. And as I started looking at this one, uh, I was kind of uh, surprised at how little material there is. As, you know, a, a, a Bible teacher, your, your connect group leader, a preacher, whoever it is, when you're going to teach a passage, you start looking for commentaries and, and, and things that people have written about a particular passage. And there's just not much about the 92nd uh, uh uh, excuse me, 93rd Psalm. Jerry did the 92nd Psalm last week, the 93rd Psalm. There's just not that much about it, and it um, uh, is very neglected. My temptation was several weeks ago, and as a matter of fact, before I left last week to go to our annual meeting of the convention, thank you, Jerry, for doing the 92nd Psalm last week while I was gone. We meet once a year as Southern Baptist, and uh, we always meet in a different city, uh, in order to allow people from different parts of the country to be able to be there. So many of our churches are very small and people can't travel a great distance. So the convention itself moves around to try to get in a proximity every few years to be close enough to different areas, particularly pioneer regions, that people would be able to go. For example, a few years ago, it was in Birmingham. Then it was in Nashville. Then it was out in Anaheim, California, so that the people in the western part of the United States that never can travel can go to it. This year, it was in New Orleans. Next year, it's in Indianapolis. So it just kind of moves around. But before I left to go to that meeting, I was thinking really that I would take Psalm 93 and 94 and put them together because 93 is only five verses, and it's just, there's just not that much 
written about it. It's really a neglected psalm. But as I really started reading it, and one of the things that I'll do is just take the passage that we're going to read. This is true whether it's Sunday morning or Wednesday. I just take the passage and read it. Just read it and then read it and then read it again and just meditate on it myself to see what the Lord would speak into my heart out of a passage. And the more I read it and thought about what it said, the more I thought this is a this is a rich passage of Scripture. Even though not much is written about it, it's a great passage. And so rather than cramming two of them together, uh, just because it's short, we're just going to deal with the 93rd Psalm and just the five verses that are there. Now, Psalm 93 through Psalm 100 begins a section that's called the Royal Psalms. And those eight Psalms basically deal with the glory of God, uh, the fact that he reigns. Jerry, did you pick the song that we sang just a minute ago uh, because you had read this passage or you just happened to pick it? The King is Coming. Uh, as, it was, as we were singing it, I was thinking, well, that goes right along with the 93rd Psalm because it, it talked about uh, the regal robes unfolded uh, and, and, and the King is coming, and that's what this passage is about, and really the next eight chapters are going to deal with that, so for the next couple of months, we'll be studying very similar passages. They are bunched together here in, the, in this section of the Psalms that deals with uh, this particular subject. Now, we don't know who wrote it. We really don't know, uh, we certainly don't know when it was written, and, and we really don't even know why it was written, but it is assumed that it was probably written shortly after the exile and they began returning to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, during that period of exile, Rodney, are you, ex are you needing me? Thank you, Rodney. I did not pray. It's not often that my sound guy reminds me that I need to pray, but uh, thank you for that. If I didn't, I didn't pray, let's pray. All right, thank you, Rodney. Heavenly Father, we do pause to thank you for the day, for your blessings, and for uh, just the opportunity to gather. We shared prayer requests earlier. We pray for each of them. We pray for uh, our community. We pray for our church. We pray for our nation as we move uh, into a cycle again where it, the elections will begin to be conversations that are uh, daily and will uh, even get to the point where we're tired of hearing that news. We pray for your wisdom as we, as we move forward as a nation. We pray for um, you to lead us in the right way. We pray for peace uh, overseas. We continue to pray for the situation in Ukraine. We've been praying that now for a year and a half. We continue to pray for uh, 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 peace to come to that part of the world. Thank you, Lord, for the day and for its blessings and for your presence with us in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, Rodney, thank you. I, I, I didn't know if we were having a problem and needed to start over or what, but uh, thank you for that reminder. All right, so now tell me where I was, Rodney, since you interrupted me. Uh, whatever I was talking about, I don't remember, but we are, we are in the 93rd Psalm. And uh, this particular passage, um, it's, it's dealing with the majesty, the glory. Uh, it was probably written as they were returning from the exile. While they were in exile, they had begun to question if God was still on the throne. It seemed as though God had been toppled from his place of uh, reigning. I think this passage serves as a reminder to us that when we go through difficulties of life, when um, life is bleak and dark and, and, and those moments, and we've all had these, where it's hard to see how God could be in something. It's a reminder to us that God is at work even in those circumstances and those situations and that we can trust him, that he reigns and that he is indeed on his throne. Um, we're going to work our way down through this, but what I want you to do, uh, and I, I may, uh, it's, since it's so short, we'll work our way through it and look at the, the different verses, and then I may just read all of the five verses in their entirety as we, as we get through it. But it starts with a simple statement, the Lord reigns. And again, this is one of the royal psalms. It begins a series of eight royal psalms from 93 to chapter 100. The Lord reigns. That means he's king. Now, he's going to describe uh, how God reigns, and uh, um, you'll notice some words as I move down through this 
that tells us how the psalmist sees this expressed. And the first thing that he says there in verse 1 has to do with the word majesty. So the Lord reigns majestically. It says the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. Now, we've just seen, um, and most of us, I think, watched parts of it, if not uh, most of it. We saw a coronation of a king. It's a very unusual thing to see happen, and we saw all of the pomp, all of the um, all of the ritual that went along with that. And I, I don't know about you, but with me, I was kind of um, surprised at a little bit of the... Uh, the overwhelmingness of the robes that they wore and the, the, the size of the crowns and all of the things that went along with those things. And, and, and now he's talking about the Lord and the Lord being robed in things. And the first thing that he says is that he's robed in majesty. You remember the chorus, um, majesty, worship his majesty unto, him, unto Jesus be all glory and, and, and power and praise. Um, he, he, he's robed in majesty. Now, that means several things. It means that he has power. It means that he has authority. Um, you know, if, you, if you're in a room and, and um, the governor is scheduled to speak, there's an authority that goes with that. And when the governor comes into the room, oftentimes people stand, and of course there's an entourage with him. There's security and all of those things, and, and all of the conversation stops, and all of the focus goes on him. When the president, you know, if you're in a room where the president enters, they play hell to the chief, and everybody stands, and this entourage comes in, and there's a, there's a, a majesty, you know, there's a... There's an authority that goes with that. Now, what's interesting is that uh, one day that president will no longer be president. Now, it wouldn't be exactly true to say that they'll go back to being a normal citizen just like me and you. That's not exactly true. They'll always be an ex-president, a former president, always carry a title that way and always have a, a, a larger voice, but they won't always be president. They won't always have that authority. Their finger won't always be near the button of the phone that they can pick up to call whoever they want to call. There's an authority that goes with being king, president. He is robed in majesty. He is robed in that, in that power, in that might. One day we're going to be in the presence of the king of kings. The Lord reigns. How does he reign? How do we see his, his, uh, his reign? We see it in his majesty. But look at the second part of the verse. The Lord is robed, enveloped in strength. Now, you might write down beside the word strength, write the word power because that's what he's talking about. So he reigns not only majestically, but he reigns mightily. Now, there are a lot of ways that uh, we could describe that. Peter wrote about that over in... Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he said, For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter talks about his majesty and the might of that, the eyewitness of that. Now, you know, when, when I think about the power, the strength of the Lord, it, I, I wonder how anybody with even a thought of God's word and God's truth cannot see who God is. The early Christians saw him after he was resurrected from death. I mean, there he stood in front of them. They had seen him crucified. They had seen him put into a tomb, and there he stood with his foot on the chest of death. That's power, isn't it? That's strength. I see it, though, not only in his power over life and death, I see it in his power over creation. I get tickled sometimes. Um, you'll read an article or hear a news report and somebody's talking about how they discovered something and they've, uh, they've tested it and it's 20 gazillion years old, you know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, you people laugh at us at being people of faith and yet you 
except this idea. And, and the whole concept is that their, their thought is that the world began as just this flat surface, and so it took all of these billions of years for the earth to kind of push up the, the mountains to the height that they are, and so it took all of these billions of years and, and, and all of these billions of years for these glaciers to carve out all of these uh, valleys and lakes. And I read in Scripture that says that God formed them with his hand, that he, that he formed the mountains, and with his finger he carved out the valleys and dug out the lakes. And I accept that at face value. I take that for what the Bible says, that God created these things, that God did it. And I see his power in that, his power in creation and his power over life and death. But I also see his power in his presence with us. Here's an amazing truth. God is with you. He was with you when you woke up this morning. He was with you when you went to bed last night. You've already had a conversation with him. You opened his word this morning and read it, and he spoke to you out of his word. You prayed to him, and he heard you, and you have heard his still small voice as he has spoken to you today. And he's with you, and he lives inside of you. The presence of God is with you. That is the majesty of God. God. That is the might of God. He is robed in majesty and he is robed in strength. But look at it again. The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, enveloped in strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. Your throne has been established from the beginning. You are from eternity. You know, one of the first questions that children ask, and I've watched this through the years, and it, it, it doesn't matter the generation. When I was first starting out as a pastor years ago, and children would begin to ask questions, and in my mid-years of ministry when children would ask questions, and now in the latter side as children ask questions, it, the first question they ask is the same question. It's probably the same question you asked when you were a child and that I asked when I was a child, and it's this. It's the first really philosophical question or theological question that a child asks. They've been hearing about God in Sunday school. They heard about God in Bible school. They hear about God from their parents, and one day they start to think, and somebody says, well, where did God come from? It's really the first question a child asks. Where did God come from? Who made God? When did God begin? And here's what the Bible says. He is from everlasting to everlasting. No one created God. There's never been a time. Now, every kingdom on earth has a beginning and an end. Uh, we just saw last year Queen... Um, started to say Victoria, but it wasn't. She was a long time ago, right? Queen Elizabeth, uh, she died after a 70-plus, I think it was 71-year reign. She was the second longest ruling monarch in the history of the world, 71 years. I think the only one who reigned longer than her was the French King Louis, one of the Louis, 14th, I think, who reigned 72 years. But... Now, Charles may not have thought it was ever going to end, but everybody knew at some point Queen Elizabeth's reign would end. One thing I know for sure is that King Charles will not reign as long as she did. There will not be a 71-year reign for him. Every reign has a beginning and an ending. But the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, has no beginning and has no ending because he is from everlasting to everlasting. So he reigns majestically and he reigns mightily and he reigns eternally. You are from the beginning. Now, beginning in verse 3 and going through the, next, the, the rest of it, verse 3, 4, and 5, He's basically saying that the Lord reigns in triumph. Now, he's going to use an example here that you and I may not, we may not identify with it as strongly as they did, but let me, let me kind of remind you of why this was so key and, and 
why Scripture talks about it so much. Uh, two things that are absolutely essential for life, obviously, are fire and water. Fire and water. And water was one of those things that they had no ability to um, control. And, and fire, uh, water could uh, destroy their life, but water gave life. And, and a, a flood could wipe out a civilization, uh, the, uh, change the course of a river. Everything, everything that they knew was kind of determined by water. They would build cities by water. Water was absolutely necessary. And throughout Scripture, you see that God has control over that most basic thing that man absolutely has to have. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering of water he called the seas. Genesis chapter 8, God remembered Noah as well as all the wildlife and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water began to subside. Exodus chapter 14, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground and the waters, it was like a wall to them on the right and the left. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may come back on the Egyptians on their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, the sea returned to its normal depth. While the Egyptians were trying to escape from it, the Lord overthrew them in the sea. The waters came back and covered the chariots and the horsemen and the entire army of Pharaoh, and none of them survived. Joshua chapter 3. The Lord spoke to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so that they will know that I'm with you like I was with Moses. Command the priests carrying the ark. When you reach the edge of the water, stand in the Jordan. And when the feet of the priest who carry the ark of the Lord of all the earth come to rest in the Jordan's waters, its waters will be cut off. And the water flowing downstream will stand up in a mass. Second Kings chapter 2, we read today, Elisha and Elijah and the waters of the Jordan River stood. You get over into the New Testament. I won't take time to look at all of the passages, but how many times did Jesus show his power over water? He calmed the storm. He walked on the water. He said, I am the water of life. Whoever drinks of this water will never be thirsty again. That's why this passage is talking about water. It's so primary to them, so basic. And the psalmist is saying that God is the one who controls this. He's the one who gives it, and he's greater than this. He's using water as an example. So let's read it, verse 3. The floods have lifted up, Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. Greater than the roar of many waters, the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is majestic. There's that word again, his majesty. He's showing us how majestic he is. I think Suzanne's got some pictures. She can put them up if... She wants to. This is down in South America. It's between uh, Brazil and Argentina. I don't know how exactly you pronounce this. Some of you might can tell me, but it's spelled I-G-A-U-Z-O, Igazu, perhaps, Igazu Falls. It's a stretch of the border between Brazil and Argentina of about two miles of this kind of waterfall. There are 275 waterfalls in that two mile stretch now what's interesting is that on the on the wall on the brazilian side is inscribed this verse psalm 93 verse 4 greater than the roar of many waters the mighty breakers of the sea the lord on high is majestic well we could we could write that passage at some of the great falls that are here in Tennessee. We could go up to the Niagara Falls in New York. We could write that same passage. But listen, you can write that passage on the wall of your heart. The Lord is majestic. With all of the 
cacophony of sound around you with all of the noise that you're going to hear today, all of the news, all of the roar that goes on around us, sometimes you lose the sight of who God is in all of the noise of the world around us. But he says, in the midst of the roar of the waters, the Lord is majestic. Then he ends with this verse in verse 5. Lord, your testimonies are completely reliable. Now, you ought to underline that and put an asterisk beside it. You ought to put an exclamation mark there. Lord, your testimonies are completely reliable. That means your word is true. What God has promised, God will do. He is the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. He reigns from beginning to end And his promises are completely reliable. Holiness is the beauty of your house. And he ends with this phrase, for all the days to come. Now, some of your translations may just have one word right there. And honestly, I wish the translators of the Holman uh, Christian had just put that one word because I think it says it succinctly and beautifully. Many translations just have the word forever. That's what the word really means. It's translated for all the days to come, but it means forever and ever and ever. Lord, your testimonies are completely reliable. Holiness is the beauty of your house forever. Now, what was in the coronation that we watched just a few months ago and all of the robes that they wore and the crowns and the jewels with all of the things that we saw, all of the ceremony, all of those things, what what was really the beauty of that? Well, some would say, well, it it was the heritage. It was passed down from generation to generation. And some would say, well, it was the it was the crown jewels. It was what they wore. It was the scepter. Some would say it was the clothing. It was the robes. Well, what is it that gives the Lord his majesty? What is it that robes him with all of his beauty? That verse says that it is that the fact that his promises are true and that his holiness, God is holy. His holiness is the beauty of his house forever. Let's read it. Just, let's just read it. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, enveloped in strength. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. Your throne has been established from the beginning. You are from eternity. The floods have lifted up, Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. Greater than the roar of many waters, the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is majestic. Lord, your testimonies are completely reliable. Holiness is the beauty of your house for all the days to come. And God's people said, amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. It is forever. And we give you glory. You are full of majesty. And you will reign forever. And we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.